All right, so we left off last class looking at kind of regression output. Um, so we'll go through a couple more examples today. Uh, I think we'll probably end up talking a little bit about uh, omitted variable bias, but we'll probably pick up back up on that next week just to, to go over more examples. So we had this example, I think that, whoops, we went through with a number of days someone used marijuana each month and, and income. And then I kind of showed you some COVID data in Excel, showed you how we run regressions in Excel. So I don't remember the length of the discussion that we had on this. So I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm very specific about it. So what we're doing, right, with this linear regression is we're getting an estimate for where this like slope or this relationship between the X and Y variable is. So you almost think about it as, I'll compare it to when we were dealing with the distribution of sample proportions, we knew that should be centered around the true population proportion. In the same way, we're gonna be getting estimates for that slope, right? Based off of sample data. Well, just like sample means and sample proportions, those you can almost think about them as sample slope coefficients or sample, sample slope estimates will be centered around whatever that true population uh, slope is, if you wanna think about it that way, right? The true value of that relationship between X and Y. So we can do hypothesis testing, right? What we're always going to do, we could do left, right, two-tailed tests, values other, assume values other than zero. But 99% of the time, what you're doing with linear regression is you're assuming that there's no relationship between that X and Y variable, right? So your null hypothesis is that that slope between, that represents relationship between X and Y we're assuming that this is zero or that there's no relationship, right? If we can find strong enough evidence, right? Maybe we see a sample coefficient value way out here. We've got a two-tailed test. So we're always gonna have kind of two areas, but take this area, multiply it by two to get your p-value. Now, if our p-value is ever less than alpha, just like same rule as before, then we can reject the null. So really what that's saying is, if I see a sample slope coefficient, that's far enough away from this assumed value of zero, then I can reject the null or I can reject that there's no relationship. I found very strong evidence that there actually is a relationship between the X and Y variable, okay? So that's kind of the broader picture of what we're doing, but we don't have to find, often have to like go through the whole process of calculating test statistics, calculating, looking up the p-value, that output is given to us in Excel, right? Now, if I didn't give you that output in Excel, an example like this, right? So let's say I want to estimate, you know, how are birth weights a function of whether or not the mother smoked while pregnant, right? So we had an example like this earlier in the semester. This variable is just a one if the mother smoked at any point during the pregnancy, zero if not, okay? Um, so it's a little bit different than some of the variables we were working with last class. We would call this smoking variable a dummy variable right, or an indicator variable. It's a one or zero, right? Well, here, the way we said we interpret these coefficients, it's a one unit increase in our X variable predicts that the Y value or Y variable changes by whatever that coefficient amount is. Well, what's a one unit change in this variable for whether or not the mother smokes? The way that we think about this is it's basically going from the group that's coded as a zero to the group that's coded as a one, has whatever that coefficient is effect on the predicted Y value. So in this case, going from not smoking while pregnant to smoking while pregnant, right? From the zero to the one group would predict that birth weights go down by about 213 grams, okay? So now the one unit change is basically going from the zero to the one group. And that depends on you know, the context of the example here. It's going from not smoking to smoking while pregnant, okay? Now, Usually Excel gives me my test statistics, but I try to show this to you because honestly, I think it's an easy way for you guys to pick up points on the, on the final. If I leave off the test statistics, they should be fairly easy to calculate. So I kind of try to relate this to some other stuff that we've done. So let's do a one population example to make it look. So let's say we had the sample mean and we wanted to calculate Our test statistic, right? Where that denominator represented the standard deviation of that sample mean. 
the test statistic for our coefficients is going to follow the same format. I take the statistic I'm interested in, which is now that estimate for what the slope is. I subtract the assumed true value, but I had just told you this will always be what? Zero. So we can almost ignore that. And then I'm going to divide by, well, here, I need the standard deviation of the statistic I'm, I'm looking at. So I kind of need the standard deviation of that sample coefficient. So what we call this is our standard error, right? Or kind of S dot epsilon, right? Epsilon was that error term. So there's our standard error. So really this just becomes, take whatever estimate Excel, Excel gives you and divide it by the standard error, which that standard error is right next to it, right? So I would take negative 213, my coefficient value, divided by its standard error, 48.9. If I look at that, it's going to be roughly four, so or negative four. So my guess is if I put that in my calculator, I get that negative 4.36. Right? So all I'm doing there, right, is taking that value of negative 213, dividing it by 48.9, right? I get approximately negative 4.36. Right? So that should be an easy question, right? I mean, if I ask you for test statistics for these coefficients, you just take that coefficient estimate and you divide it by the standard error that's associated with it, right? Any questions on that? That should be easy enough. Okay. Now, once I have that test statistic based off my degrees of freedom, I could look up the, the p-value, but we're never gonna do that by hand. We're always gonna use the values that Excel gives you, but I may have some questions like on the final where I leave off the test statistic, ask you to find it. Like I said, it should be pretty easy, right? We're dividing one number by the other. Okay, just take that coefficient estimate and divide it by the associated standard error. All right. Um, I don't think I have. Uh, we went through this last class thinking about the errors, minimizing the errors. Okay. So, so I can't remember if we went through that example last, last class or not, but I wanted to make sure I reiterated some of those things that I mentioned. So, up to this point, we've done this simple linear regression. We kind of talked about the pitfalls of it at the end of last class, which is that it really just represents correlation, right? It could be that there's things that were included in the, the regression, or sorry, not included in the, in the regression that are really affecting both X and Y, right? It's not that X and Y are actually causing each other. So we want to start accounting for other factors, like controlling for other factors. So we, what we can do is add more independent variables. We can throw in more right-hand side variables there. And in just a second, I'll kind of explain how that changes kind of the value of these coefficient estimates we get. So all I do, and here instead of A and B, I'm just using beta. It's kind of a, something you'll see a lot with linear regression. We typically write the coefficients as beta. Right? So I can include n number, I can include as many variables as I want. And that's not quite technically true. If we were to kind of continue to go through some, some statistics, you know, like the next course here, um, we'll talk about things like you can't have more variables than you have observations. But for big data sets, that's never really a problem, right? So I've got all these coefficients. And I don't think I showed you the, the crime equation last class, but let's think about if I tried to estimate an equation like this, so let's say I wanted to estimate crime rates, and I think that they're a function of the amount of money that's being um, given to the police force, so police expenditures, think about it that way. And maybe I do this at the county level, okay? So I look at crime rates and, and police expenditures in those counties. Now, what ends up happening if I have data? here, we actually end up finding that this coefficient is positive, all right? This seems kind of weird, all right? That would mean that for every dollar, extra dollar spent in the police force, that crime rates actually increase, right? Well, a couple of things can be happening here. One, you know, maybe having more police, you're able to kind of identify more crime, but probably what's more likely, because you would think that, you know, higher police force expenditures actually de deter crime, right? So why am I getting a positive effect? Why is it negative here? Well, what counties are going to be spending more on their police force? Counties that need to, right? Counties that, that just kind of start out with factors that would cause more crime, like high unemployment rates, lower income, 
uh, you know, kind of go down the list of things that drive drive individuals to crime. So it's not that police force expenditures are driving crime. It's that I've got these outside factors like high unemployment rates that cause people to um, commit more crimes, but are also going to force those counties to spend more on their police force. So I need to account for all these other other factors. All right. So what I can do. Oops is add in as additional controls, right, other variables. So here I could control for the unemployment rate. And when I say control for, this is what the interpretation now becomes. So now I would still interpret this coefficient on the police force expenditures as one more dollar spent in my police force would predict that crime rates go up or down by whatever this coefficient beta one is, holding everything else constant. So holding the unemployment rate in the county constant. So the thought experiment that linear regression allows us to do is say, look, if we had two counties with exactly the same unemployment rate, but one of them spends one more dollar on their police force, what's the impact on their crime rates, right? And that's a lot more powerful than just saying spending one more dollar, right? Because we can control for this other, other outside factor. And we don't just have to include one. We can include like unemployment rate, income, whether or not it's in a, in a metro area, all, all these other things that we think probably also help us predict the crime rates in the county, okay? So essentially what our goal is on the right-hand side, even if we're interested in that relationship between police force expenditures and crime rates, we're able to include as many other factors as we can that we think would help us predict what crime rates are. So we can get a lot more accurate predictions, right? If I'm just trying to predict crime rates with police force expenditures, I'm gonna be way off of the actual Y values. Whereas if I can include unemployment rates, average income, whether that's in a metro, my predictions are gonna be a lot closer to the actual Y values because I'm including more things that impact crime rates. Okay. So you know, if I add that in, it's likely that even just including the employment rate, I see that coefficient of beta one actually changes. Okay. Now I'll show you an example in Excel with some actual values that we can, I think, prove this. So I can do the exact same thing when I'm including these additional independent variables. Well, now instead of just my intercept and my slope, so I don't take a derivative of this function in respect to two things, I take a derivative of it in respect to every coefficient. Well, it doesn't really matter because I, instead of two equation, two unknowns, I'll have n equation, n unknowns. I can still solve that. The math is terrible. But I actually think I have a, yeah, you can go to this slide and I can show you the matrix algebra. It doesn't matter how many variables you have, you can solve for these coefficients. And basically, what that you know, math proof kind of results in is the interpretation is exactly the same, but you're able to then add to the end, holding all else constant, holding all, everything else in this regression constant. Okay. So, right, one more thing that we're, we're statistic that we might now be interested in is something called the R squared. Right? Once we know we can start adding in more variables to help us make predictions, what we can think about is there's some original variation. If I'm just looking at that Y variable. So let's say I look at, you know, the, the crime rate variable. There's, there's a certain amount of variation that just exists in that variable. Right? And what I essentially want to do with all of my independent variables is account for or explain all of what that variation is. That variation is a result of unemployment rates. That variation is a result of police force expenditures. That variation, you know, all these things that I think that would probably be causing differences in crime rates. So I don't know why I said of course here. I don't think it's necessarily clear, but the R squared, we'll call another term as the coefficient of determination, okay? And what it does is it looks at that amount of variation in my Y variable, and it says how much of it is explained by all of these factors, all of these X variables that I've included in the regression. Okay? And the way that we can do that is look at my predicted Y values and say how much variation exists in those predictions relative to the variation that exists in the actual Y value. So, you know, we'll call kind of here, you know, this numerator, the sum of the squared or some of the squares from the regression. It's basically just the variation. This kind of looks like a variance equation, right? Or at least the numerator of the variance equation. And it's picking up how much variation exists in my predicted Y values. Remember my predicted Y values are the ones that are just using those independent variables I've included. So that numerator, in my R squared is how much variation exists in my predictions relative or divided by the variation that exists in the actual Y values. Now, 
you don't ever have to go through and calculate SSR or SST, right? The total sum of squares and the, and the sum of squares of regression. Um, but if, if you I think that's actually, I'll show you in the Excel output, they are given to you. But Excel also gives you the R squared, right? So once you have that R squared, you can just think about it and interpret it as that's the amount or the percent of the variation in your Y variable that you're explaining with all of your independent or X variables, okay? Um, you know, so if we had, let's say I had some relationship where I knew every factor that mattered, right? So I have included every single variable that would help predict whatever Y variable I'm looking at. My R squared, the highest it could be, is I'm explaining all of the variation using my X variables, which would mean the highest my R squared could be is one, right? Or a hundred percent of the, I can explain a hundred percent of the variation, right? But we kind of see the R squared measured from zero to one, right? So it's, a, it's like in decimal form, if you want to think about that way. It's representing the proportion of the variation you can explain to convert it to a percentage, you would just multiply it by a hundred. Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about correlation and kind of adding in these additional independent variables. And then we'll take out a look at a file in Excel. So, you know, if I see this as positive, does it really mean that spending more on the police force reduces crime? We've already kind of talked about no. It's like that there's all these outside factors that we're not accounting for, or what we kind of call this is the omitted variable bias. We can think about it in the context of the smoking while pregnant variable. Right? If I, you know, we ran that regression, we saw a huge negative impact. It meant that the child would be born 250 grams less, right? Which I think the average is like just over 3,000. So I mean, it's a pretty sizable kind of reduction in birth weight. However, if I just run this simple linear regression, what do you think, and then not, you know, what characteristic might be consistent across individuals who are smoking while pregnant? Well, if we look at the data, they tend to have lower education levels. They tend to be from lower socioeconomic classes, right? It's not maybe that they're necessarily being, you know, uh, malicious. They're, they're just ignorant to the negative health effects that this might have, right? Well, individuals who have less money come from lower education levels are also less likely to know things about prenatal care, right? And if you don't say, you know, prenatal vitamins or aren't as likely to be able to have as many checkups, right? Because they just don't have as much money to, to pay for the healthcare. And so all these other factors would also lead to lower birth weights, less, less healthy pregnancies. So that smoking variable, we saw that huge negative coefficient, but we it's probably kind of also picking up the effects of not having as much, as much money to, to, you know, spend on your healthcare during your pregnancy, not having as, as, as much money to spend on high quality foods and, and vitamins and things like that. So we could account for those factors. What we actually see is smoking while pregnant, yes, has a negative impact on birth weights, but not near as large as that coefficient we saw um, just from running the simple linear regression, right? So what we'd like to do is try to account for all those other things. So then we could say, what's the effect of smoking while pregnant on birth weights holding constant income? So two people with the same income, same education levels, same age, you know, account for all these other factors, but one of them smokes while pregnant and the other doesn't. That's a lot more powerful of a statement, right? So we're not really picking up causation. The more control variables that we can add in, the closer and closer we're getting to, to be able to, to kind of think of this as a causal relationship. But if we're omitting important variables there on the right-hand side, it's gonna bias what we call biasing that estimate. Right? Our estimate's gonna be a little bit skewed. And I think I have a slide here that kind of shows that. Now you don't have to worry about all the, all the steps here, but basically the math, if you kind of work through this mathematical proof, the estimate that you see for that relationship between X1 and Y, if there's another important variable that helps us predict Y, call it X2, and it's correlated with X1, right? So that covariance is something other than zero. Notice the estimate we see will pick up the true population effect but also this additional what we call bias component, right? It'll bias our estimate. Now, if we include X2 in our regression here, this term goes away. We can actually, if you, you know, work through the, the, the matrix algebra, you're actually able to hold that constant. And so by including X2 in our regression, we could eliminate the bias that exists in the estimate we will see for that coefficient on, on our X1 variable. So kind of long story short, right? If we include more variables on the right-hand side, we can eliminate a lot of the bias that might exist in these coefficients, right? 
Um, you know, another good example, I, I, I forget where I saw this graphic, but you know, if I look at this uh, autism rates and organic food sales, if I run a regression with annual data, it's gonna look like these have a very strong positive correlation, right? Well, organic food sales are not causing autism rates to increase, right? We know that, and I mean, I guess we don't, maybe don't, we don't know that right away, but like it, it, there's no pathway through which that could occur. And it's likely there's outside factors that are driving both of these things up, right? I don't know what that might be, you know, increased uh, you know, attention to, to health, um, higher levels of income, right? Where I think, uh, you know, just over time, I think probably the, the, the uh, more realistic story is something like a, an attention to, to health, right? But, you know, if we do just run a simple linear regression, it's gonna look like these two things are highly correlated, which they are, but they're not causing each other, right? It's probably some outside factor that we haven't accounted for, okay? So uh, correlation is not causation. I always like this little graphic, right? I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe, right? Because maybe it wasn't that the class helped me understand this difference. Maybe it was something that was correlated with me taking the class and also understand this, right? That I wasn't accounting for, okay? So I think the example I have here, yeah. So I'll, uh, I think I put this up there on Canvas this morning. And hopefully I dragged and dropped it. Oh, where is this? Is it not? Oh, well, that would help. So there should be a file up on Canvas called GPA data. So let's just double check that. We got this section. Go to files, in class data, GPA omitted variable. So that's the that's the file that we're going to use. So I go here. Oh, I know where it's at. I left it in here, didn't I? Yep. So an interest, so I've, I've got kind of this GPA omitted variable. I think the one I uploaded for this class, we just had the sheet one there. If you have the other sheets, just ignore those for right now. We're just going to kind of use this sheet one, which has this data set that has a bunch of college student GPAs. It had what their SAT score was, whether or not they're student athlete, all these other things. Okay. Well, one thing we might be interested in, like a question that you could think about is, is being a student athlete in college, does it have a detrimental or, or does it have a beneficial impact on how you perform in, so, during college? So the story goes, you know, being a student athlete takes a lot of additional time. I remember when I was a, an undergrad, I had, there's this econ major who was on the football team. I think he was the long snapper. And he would like explain to me his week. And it was like, how do you find time to do anything? Like they had like film every day, like, weight room, but also practice, like it, it was just booked all day, right? So you have a much busier schedule, but at the same time, you know, would have helped me probably to be in something a little more structured like that when I was 18 going to college, because it gives you a lot more time management skills, right? It teaches you very quickly how you manage your time. So maybe it has a positive effect, maybe it has a negative effect, right? So we, we might go, okay, all right, let's uh, look at this data and let's run a regression. And we're gonna think about maybe college GPA, so that's going to be our Y variable, depends on whether or not someone's a student athlete. So we'll use this one zero variable that identified was the college student and athlete or not. We've selected the labels, right? Hit OK. okay. So now when I'm looking at this output, we've got a couple of new things that we can actually look at. Right? First of all, what percent of the variation am I explaining or what proportion of the variation am I, am I explaining? in the variation GPA by simply that student athlete variable. 0 0.008, so 0.8% of the variation. So not very much, right? It's a very small piece of the pie, right? Um, there's a lot of other things that probably are a lot more useful, like probably the person's SAT score or how many credit hours they've taken in college so far. But we do start to see that that R squared is there, okay? Now, for this class, we're not going to use the multiple R, the adjusted R squared. Those are some additional kind of topics that we would kind of talk about if we, we had uh, another month or so. But for us, we are going to use that R squared now. Okay. I then go down and I look at these coefficients and my p-values. And I said, well, look, that student athlete variable, it looks like if I have a one unit increase in it, which is a zero one. So going from the zero to the one. So not being a student athlete 
to being a student athlete would predict my GPA goes down by 0.28 points, right? Which in the context of GPA, it's a pretty sizable effect, right? On a zero to four scale, a reduction of point, what, two, two eight is pretty large. And that P value, when I see these E to the negative zero nine, that means move the decimal nine places to the left. So this is point eight zeros and then a four, right? This P value is basically zero. Anytime you see E to the negative in Excel, that basically means zero, okay? So if my P value is basically zero, right? if we remember what we said earlier is the null is that the relationship is always zero. So I'm thinking, or, um, I'm thinking about predicting GPAs using whether or not this person's an athlete. I'm assuming that relationship is zero. I just found a p-value that's approximately zero. So that's gonna be less than alpha, no matter what level of confidence I, I wanna do, right? So with like 99% confidence, I could reject this null, right? And say that, there isn't no relationship, right? Or if think about what we start out assuming is that there's no relationship. So I can reject that, right? Because my p-value is less than alpha. Or I found significant evidence that there is a relationship, okay? At least I can say that with 99% confidence, right? Because my p-value is very, very low. Any questions over anything I said there or about the Concepts, want to hear something said again? We keep moving. Okay with this? All right, so what we would typically say, we speak a little bit different when it comes to linear regression. So I like said, so you can kind of think about like my alphas. Um, so like 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0 0.1. The significance levels would be one, five, and 10%. And that's typically how coefficients are discussed, right? They kind of have corresponding confidence levels, right? 99, 95, and 90. But we generally don't say that when we're talking about slope estimates. I'm not, you know, to, to get into the nuances of why, it's not overly important for this class, but we generally say things are significant and we, and we kind of use these significant levels. So here I would say with a P value of basically zero, that that coefficient estimate on, on a student athlete is significant at the one, five, and 10% levels, okay? Or I can reject at all those, those levels. So we go back here. We might go to the university and say, look, you should shut down all your, your athletic programs, right? You're, you're hurting your, your student at, uh, at your academic performance, right? But there's likely a lot of things that are correlated with being a student athlete, like especially if this college set comes from D1 universities, Right? When we look at the data, we, we definitely see, you know, for men's basketball and football programs, colleges are definitely a little bit more lenient on the academic kind of standards for, for their student athletes relative to their student body, right? So we'll go back and say, okay, well, do I have some measure of the intellectual ability or incoming intellectual ability of these students? Well, it's not perfect, right? Some people aren't great at taking tests, but it's a decent measure, right? It's some measure that we can use. So we'll use that SAT score variable, right? So simply by including that SAT score variable, so all I do is select both the variables I want, control shift or command shift on a Mac, hit the down arrow. Now I'll run this regression again. Now we'll see by including GPAs, I increase my R squared to 0.16. So I'm now explaining at least about 16% of the variation that exists in GPAs. And if I look at that coefficient on athlete, it's fallen from negative 0.28 to negative 0.05, right? So it looks like it's less, way less detrimental to be a student athlete in, you know, on your academic performance. And what's more, if I look at this p-value of 0.26, can I actually say that this is statistically any different from zero? Well, I can't at a p-value of 0.26. Is that gonna be less than even an alpha of 0.1? No. So I'm gonna to fail to reject the null. If I fail to reject the null, what I'm saying is, based off the sample evidence I have, I can't say that that relationship between GPA and being a student athlete is anything other than zero. And that was simply because the correlation of that one variable, SAT score, right? 
by omitting that variable. I was biasing the estimates that I was seeing. But once I included it in my regression, I kind of eliminated that bias, right? Let's go back here. We could also interpret the SAT score variable and it is highly significant, right? This p-value is very, very close to zero. So, right, e to the negative 159 would mean move the decimal point 159 places to the left. This is basically zero. So how would I interpret this SAT score variable? Remember, we always do a one unit change in the X variable causes my predicted Y to change by whatever that coefficient. So how would I interpret that? What would a one unit increase in the SAT be? One more point on the SAT score, right? So my units for the SAT score, just the points that I'm earning in the SAT. So one more point on the SAT score would predict that my GPA goes up by 0 .00, about 2, or 0 0.0019. And that might seem really small, but one point on the SAT score is really small, right? So it's maybe a little bit more useful to be, well, what if I get 100 points more on the SAT score? Well, if I know the effect of one point, how do you think maybe I could get the effect of 100? Simply, yeah, right? So I could say, take that coefficient that shows me the effect of one unit, multiply it by 100. Okay, now this makes a little more sense. If someone went from like an 1100 to a 1200 SAT, we would predict their GPAs would be about 0.2 higher. And that, that sounds reasonable, right? Um, it's not the largest effect, but it's, you know, on a zero to four scale, it's not, it's not nothing either. Okay. Any questions on, on that? Start to hopefully to maybe see some of the usefulness of, of what we can do with these linear regression results. Um, where are we at in time? Okay, so the other thing I wanted to show you here is if we go back to that data on sheet one, well, I've got a lot of other variables in here that look like they might help, you know, or might be correlated with being a student athlete as well. So let me just throw the kitchen sink at this, right? So I go to my regression. I still have my Y variable GPA selected, so that's good. My X variables, I'm just gonna include everything, right? And for now, don't worry about this SAT squared term. I might show something to you next week that, that kind of talks about this, but for now, just know that it's, it could be another useful kind of uh, right-hand side variable. So I'm gonna include everything I've got in my, my data set and just try to control for as many things as possible. Right? So actually, I didn't select everything, now I just pointed to it. So I'm gonna select, from SAT to SAT squared. I've got my label selected, hit okay. Zoom in so we can see this. Well, now notice I can explain about 30% of the variation, right? And that makes sense. If I'm just including more factors on that right-hand side, I can probably explain or, or more of the variation or come up with better predictions. Right? And then go down here. I've got a ton of different coefficients. I've got a bunch of different p-values. If I go through here, I can very quickly say, okay, which of these variables can I say have a significant relationship with GPA? And let's say we want to do it at the 90% level, so an alpha of 0.1. Well, basically what we would do is go through every single variable's p-value, and if it's less than 0.1, then we would reject the null. Remember, the null was that there's no relationship. So if we can reject the null, what we're really saying is we found evidence there is a significant relationship between these variables. So we go through the intercept is significant, SAT score, athlete, verbal math, everything here is significant. Oh, looks like race, right? Kind of doesn't, doesn't impact as much kind of the being white or not relative to, you know, the other, we only kind of include two racial groups here, but if we had more information on this, you know, we could kind of create indicators for every single possible one, any demographic we want really. Total credit hours, has an, a significant effect, high school size, and then that squared term also. So everything in here looks like it's pretty helpful at explaining the variation in GPA, right? So most of almost all but one of these was a significant, you know, we could reject the null, okay? But what we really wanna focus on now is once I control for all these other factors, now look at what happens to the coefficient on student athlete. We actually now, going from being a non-athlete to an athlete, looks like it actually imp uh, improves GPAs by about 0.12 points, and it's significant at even a 99% level or the 1% significance level, right? So 
starting out with a very naive regression, we might think, okay, being a student athlete is really bad for the student's academic performance. As we add in additional controls, we eventually see, well, no, that student athlete coefficient was really just picking up the negative effects of all you know, these other things that it was correlated with, right? That they maybe tended to come in at, at a lower intellectual level or, or ability level, right? And kind of trying to pick that up with the SAT score. Um, maybe some of them might be taking more credit hours or less credit hours or whatever those, those relationships are. So once we account for them, what we now can say is two students who have the same SAT score, got the same score on this verbal math test that, that, um, that they were using, have the exact same rank in their high school, were either both male or female, were either both white, black, or, or kind of uh, some, some you know, other minority group, both have the same total number of credit hours, both from the same high school size. Well, if they have the same SAT, they'll have the same SAT squared. All of that is exactly the same, but one of them is a student athlete, then their GPA would increase by 0.12. That's a lot more powerful of a statement than the naive regression that we started out. Right? So, you know, using this linear regression tool um, really is way more powerful probably than anything we've done in this class so far, right? Because most of the other things we've looked at, it was very hard to control for other factors. With matched pairs, we kind of did because we were looking at within person or within subject analysis, but um, this gives us a lot more power, okay? Um, let me see what else I had here. I think that was the last slide. So I think we'll get out of here a little bit early today. Um, what I want to do next class is just keep looking at more examples of linear regression, um, talking through um, maybe some, I might introduce you to some things that I'll tell you that you don't expect you to know this for the exam, but this would be kind of the next step in linear regression to kind of show you a little bit more of its power. Um, but working through more examples, we're going to be getting uh, you know more interpretation of variables. So hopefully this starts to become kind of secondhand. Uh, you know, the final is not comprehensive in the fact that it's really just covering the material since the last exam. So we've got all that two population stuff. We then had that matched pairs, and then we're going to have linear regression. So it's a little less computational. I mean, the first half of stuff we've covered is computational. The second half is definitely a little bit different, right? It's a little bit more interpret this like. What is this telling us? Because I really want to make sure you're kind of grasping like more of the concept of what we're doing with, with linear regression. Okay. So we'll kind of pick up with some more examples on Monday. Um, I think that's that's it for me, unless there's any questions. All right. All right. Have a, have a good weekend. Stay safe. And I will see you on Monday.